Hello and welcome to another plant material webinar. Today we're going to discuss the types of information you need to consider when you're preparing a seed bed and installing a seeding for conservation practices. We're going to talk about soil and vegetation components of the seed bed prep, equipment used to prepare the site, the equipment used for installing the seeding, and the timing of seeding. I want to remind you that this webinar is one of six in a series that describes the seeding process. Um, because the webinar builds on each other, we really recommend that you go back and view some of the previous webinars because some of the information in a previous webinar might be needed to fully understand information in another webinar. If you're looking for the webinars, they're on the Montana Wyoming Plant Materials website. Um, and I encourage you to view those. You might be asking yourself, why is seedbed preparation important? And the main reason is to provide seed in an environment where it can have the optimal conditions for germination. Seed really requires three main components, water, oxygen, and favorable temperatures for germination. Germination is a three-step process where seed imbibes water, then a chemical reaction occurs to turn the endosperm into a usable form of, to fuel cell growth, and then cells begin to divide and grow. Soil that has good contact with the seed transfers water efficiently to the germinating seed, allowing it to grow roots into the deeper soil moisture. Good seed bed preparation provides for seed to soil contact by creating the ideal soil firmness. If the soil is too loose, then air in the soil increases the amount of wetting and drying cycles in the soil. And in contrast, if the seed bed is too firm, it's difficult to get the seed into the soil and for the seedling to emerge. So in summary, to prepare um, a proper seed bed, we want good seed to soil contact that allows a germinating seed to uptake soil moisture for a long enough period of time to survive and establish a stand. Seedbed preparation is the most important step in the seeding process. The specifics of how you prepare the site are really gonna be based on the site conditions and of the individual site that you're working on. It's also gonna depend on the species you're seeding and the equipment that you have available to use. We'll get into those details throughout the presentation. We can think of site preparation as creating a safe site for seed. The safe site provides resources necessary for germination, including water and nutrients. And it's free from hazards such as competition from other species or exposure to excessive heat or exposure to predators or more. The site should be able to capture water and nutrients for plant growth. And you can see on this photo on the left that the soil is textured, which allows water and nutrients to be captured on that site and then hopefully allowing water to infiltrate into the soil. In the Western United States, the plant material program has inspected hundreds of plantings in the last 65 to 70 years, and have found that the most common cause of conservation seeding failures is from poor seedbed preparation. Seedbed deficiencies include soil looseness, dryness near the soil surface, seeding too deep, and excessive weed competition. Other establishment failures or can be caused by things such as drought, plant disease, poor quality seed, um, insects or pest outbreaks, and improper grazing management. Some of the factors such as drought or disease outbreaks are really out of our control, but if we do everything in our power to provide an ideal seed bed, which would be addressing these factors up top, the soil looseness, the seeding depth, the reducing weed competition, then we're really increasing the chances of being able to establish a good stand. So in summary, again, the ideal seed bed is going to be uniformly firm, it's going to have soil moisture near, near the surface, and it's going to be free of competing vegetation. 
As a rule of thumb, the seedbed needs to be firm enough to leave a human footprint less than a half an inch deep. You can see that in this photo of a prepared seed bed that somebody walked across. Now this doesn't mean that the soil just below the surface can be extremely hard packed because that creates a situation where the seeds germinate but then they die because the roots are unable to grow fast enough to access the subsurface moisture. Uh, the soil should be uncompacted to allow the root growth. And also when the seed bed is too firm, it can also be difficult to get the seed into the ground. What we're aiming for is soil to be firm enough to allow the good seed to soil, soil contact that it needs um, to be able to uptake that soil moisture, but loose enough to allow a seed to sprout and penetrate the soil. And the site should also be free of competing vegetation or weedy vegetation as much as possible. Seedbed preparation includes both soil and vegetation considerations. And what you do for your seedbed preparation is really going to depend on your site conditions again. So what um, seeding methods you're using, what equipment you have on the site, how you can access the site. But in general, you're going to be using methods to address preparing the soil, that's creating the safe sites that we talked about, and using methods to control any existing vegetation on the site prior to seeding. So you might be using one or a combination of different techniques to address the soil properties, such as um, tillage or disking, harrowing, imprinting, and surface roughening. And you may be doing that in combination one, one or more techniques to address the existing plants on the, the site, including the use of herbicides, cover crops, grazing, uh, prescribed fire, all for preparing the site. Let's start by talking about soil preparation methods and conventional seedbed preparation. So um, conventional seedbed preparation or tillage is commonly used when we're seeding into a previously cropped land or when you're doing a pasture renovation and it's least often used in a rangeland seeding. Other places that you might use conventional tillage are places with extreme soil compaction or hard pan issues. And as part of NRCS recommendations, we really try to avoid soil disturbance, which can cause erosion and have negative effects on soil aggregation or soil microbiota. However, there's gonna be times when tillage is useful for site preparation. And in some cases, conventional tillage can be an effective method for controlling existing vegetation and removing excessive cover. But you should also know that it's gonna be the most expensive type of site prep in terms of the time that's gonna be required and the energy that's gonna be used. Um, conventional seed beds are usually prepared in two different phases. So the first phase would be considered the primary tillage and you would use a plow, a disc, um, or, or other implements that um, you could till the site to begin with. So after the primary tillage then is complete, the final seedbed prep Operation is performed to smooth and firm the seed bed. And for that, you're going to be using roller harrows or culture packers, spike tooth harrows or spring tooth harrows, um, all to break up the large clods of soil that are on the site and also to smooth and firm the soil for the final seed bed. It's going to be really important that you have adequate soil moisture when you're going to be firming the seed bed when you use uh, conventional seed bed preparation. And if you don't have good soil moisture, I'd recommend waiting until you get um, a rainfall or something that can improve the soil mo moisture conditions. Uh, for those of you who aren't real familiar with some of the equipment, we're gonna take a look at some of the, the features of the different equipment up close. So this is a photo of a cultipacker so culture packers combine a spring tooth harrow with a packer in order to stir the soil and then pack it, the seed bed in one operation. You can see here that the harrows are set to a soil depth. Uh, we 
want to set them to a depth where moisture is located if it's not too deep. And that way the harrow can help bring the moisture up um, to the soil surface or where the seed can access it. And it also is used to kill any weeds um, that are on the area, in the area before we seed. And then the cultipacker wheels help firm the soil and by firming it, we're also allowing the soil moisture to stay near the soil surface where it can be available for seed germination. And that assumes that the seeding is gonna occur immediately after you're cult packing um, the field. As the secondary step in a um, conventional tillage, we might use a cult packer to go over the field two or three times to create a firm seed bed. And if you do, the second and third operations would eliminate the use of the harrow in the ground. So you're, then you're just going to be running over the field with the cultipacker. Um, other equipment you might use to firm the field would be um, a shop made rubber tire packer like in this insert photo. Seeding directly into standing stubble is a more common practice for NRCS seedings. And you can see here we're seeding into a previously cropped area uh, where the seed can be directly seeded into um, grain stubble on coarse to medium textured soils. This no-till drill um, cuts an opening in the soil, then the seed is dropped into the opening, and then a packer wheel firms the soil over the field or over the seed. And the benefits of seeding into stubble is that it provides an already firm seed bed. We have a favorable microclimate for seedling establishment and it minimizes any disturbance to the soil. Um, I will note that if you have a lot of grain straw that it should be removed from the field or shredded or at least uniformly scattered on the site. And this is going to help you get good seed to soil contact. You want to be careful if you have some ground disturbance in your standing stubble because if you're seeding into an old grain field, you might get a flush of um, that grain, that uh, volunteer grain on the site. Uh, and if you do that, it's really not recommended to seed directly into it because you're going to have too much competition with those grain seedlings. But instead, you can um, include a herbicide application as one of your steps when you're seeding the site. I do want to mention that um, the no-till seedbed prep does have some limitations. For example, if you're using it on cropland that is flood irrigated or furrow irrigated, um, you need to be aware that some of the plant residue could possibly plug the furrows and prevent the spread of water. Seeding into stubble or drill seeding sites with no soil disturbance is the most common uh, way that we're putting in NRCS seedings uh, in either cropland or pasture renovation or rangeland. And the benefits of seeding into standing stubble include that we have reduced soil disturbance. And because we have less soil disturbance, we also reduce the risk of soil erosion and then we limit the disturbance to our soil aggregates and soil microbes. So here you can see a photo that we're seeding a site where vegetation has been controlled with either one or more herbicide applications. And then the drill seeder is seeding the site by cutting a trough, allowing the seed to drop into the trough, and then firming the soil over the seed with the packer wheels. And for those of you who aren't familiar with a drill seeder, this is an up close photo of a seeder. Um, the drills usually have one or two discs in the front that cut into the soil at a specified depth. The disc then can cut down through the stubble. And those discs are gonna be creating a furrow opening. And then our seed coming from our seed boxes up here is gonna travel through the tubes and drop down into the furrow. And here's a close up picture where you can see the, the tubes coming down. These are the disc openings. They're creating a furrow in the soil. And then after the seed is dropped, the packer wheels go over the top and create that good seed to soil contact that we've been talking about. 
Other methods for preparing the soil include minor disturbances that can be used to texture the soil and create the safe sites for seed, water, and nutrients to collect and form favorable microenvironments for a seedling establishment. Soil texturing is usually used in a combination with broadcast seeding. And some tools you might use would be a spike tooth harrow like this one here or a spring tooth harrow. You might also use an imprinter to create surface roughness like is shown down here on the bottom left. So in this photo, you can see that the imprinter created a site for the seed to land. Also, it's a site where water and nutrients can collect and help create a good environment for the seed to germinate. In this picture, we also controlled existing vegetation with a herbicide application prior to seeding. And then just remember that you can also go over the site with other implements like rollers to help firm the soil over the top of the seed. Soil texturing can also be done by hand raking or light scarification to loosen the upper part of the soil profile before you seed. And something like a hand um, operation like this is going to be mostly applicable for sites that are too small uh, for large equipment to efficiently access the site or the site's not going to be accessible at all to equipment. And some areas that you might use this might be um, where you've had a forest harvest operation and you had a log pile that you burned and you have just a small area that you want to reseed. You can use hand raking or hand tools to lightly um, texture and harrow the soil before seeding. You can also use equipment that you're going to be using on the site to help prepare your, your soil seed bed. And in, in this photo on the bottom of a forestry operation, you can see that the tracks of the machine create a nice seed bed for seed and water and nutrients to collect into um, and German, provide a good site for germination. Um, just a caution, if you are using equipment to track a site, and create soil texture to make sure you do it perpendicular to the slope so you don't have um, increased issues with soil erosion. When you're preparing your seed bed, you need to be aware of the soil moisture that's on the site and also the potential for any soil crusting. So soils have to be dry enough for tillage equipment to work without causing soils to ball up or form clods and also not get your equipment stuck. Um, in, in, um, you also need to make sure that your soils are going to be dry or not too dry so that the tillage would cause the soils to pulverize into a flower-like consistency because that can be equally bad. So a good rule of thumb is to have moist soils to a depth of at least 12 inches before you spring plant on a dry land site. And this will uh, provide adequate moisture for your seed to germinate and grow. You should also be aware of the potential for the soil you're working with to form a, a soil crust. In these cases, tillage is not recommended. For example, on a saline or sodic soils where the conventional tillage can bring the salts to the surface, it can also destroy the soil structure and surface residue and form a soil crust. So if you're working in an area where soil crusting is possible, consider reducing your tillage or disc activities. Select large seeded species that might be more likely to break the soil surface and continue irrigation to manage sodium accumulation at the surface. Let's change topic now and talk about addressing existing vegetation as part of our seed bed preparation. You can see in this photo that the presence of weeds or other perennial vegetation um, can really have an effect on how good your seed bed is and the success of your seeding. Before anything is seeded and about the time that you're um, preparing the soil seed bed, you need to think about ways to reduce the weeds and other vegetation. And if you are planning to seed into a field that has a lot of weeds, really the best situation is if you can delay 
the planting until the weeds are controlled, that's going to be your best option for success. Uh, herbicide applications are a common method for controlling existing vegetation and weeds as part of seedbed preparation. Uh, one widely used method is to spray a late season non-selective herbicide such as glyphosate to kill any existing vegetation and then follow that with a fall dormant seeding. But the herbicide that you use and the timing of application, um, any need for repeated applications, it's all really going to depend on the plant species that you're trying to control and the extent of the infestation. For example, if you're trying to manage pigweed, it's going to be very different than if you're managing cheatgrass or leafy spurge or crested wheatgrass. So I would encourage you to consult weed management resources that are offered through the U.S. DA and RCS, and also reach out to extension specialists and the county weed and pest offices for more information. When using herbicides, I really can't overemphasize the need to check the herbicide label first so that you're informed of when you need to spray, when you can seed, and what species you might want to seed or what species to avoid. The weed control really needs to be well planned prior to the seeding because what you're going to do for weed control is going to dictate your seeding practice. When planning a seeding, it's really important to know what the chemical history of the field is, especially two to three years prior to seeding a site. Um, that's because many of our herbicides have residual carryover that can cause seedings to fail. So any potential herbicide carryover has to be addressed and you can do that by delaying the seeding or establishing a cover crop or just changing the species that you plan to plant. So check your herbicide label to determine if you have any restrictions on replanting or if there's a time period that you need to wait before replanting after you spray. Um, and so you can adequately control the weeds and also have a successful seeding. If you're using herbicides, you also need to know a few things about the herbicide. First of all, you should know if it's a non-selective herbicide, meaning it kills all vegetation, or if it's a selective herbicide, meaning it's going to affect some plants, but not all. Uh, you should also know if you're using a pre or post emergent herbicide, meaning you're killing the weeds before they germinate or after they germinate. So again, just go back and look at your herbicide label to get more information. The use of cover crops is another method for controlling existing vegetation and weeds prior to establishing a perennial conservation seeding. The cover crop has a lot of benefits in that it can grow quickly, it can utilize excess soil nutrients, and you can also reduce the competitiveness of weeds. Um, also, if you're working on a site that has a high amount of organic matter, it can allow time for that vegetation to break down and decompose into mineral soils. For example, if you're on a site that was a previously a pasture site and you have a lot of um, sod, um, litter, and biomass on the site, that sod is going to interfere with some of your seeding. So it could interfere with the getting your seed into the ground or um, just the seed to soil contact that you might have in the first two inches of the soil. So using a cover crop, which you can often see deeper than that, is going to help provide time to break down some of that litter on the site and incorporate that in organic matter into the soil um, prior to you putting in a perennial seeding. If you're seeding on a site that has a lot of vegetative litter or biomass, you can also use grazing or prescribed fire to remove the standing dead biomass before seeding. For example, on this rangeland site, um, the vegetation has been treated, so it's standing dead biomass at this time. And you can see that there's going to be some issues with it getting bound up in the equipment that you're using to seed the site. And there's also potential that some of that litter 
um, might prevent your seed from getting in good contact with the soil because it might just get tied up in the plant litter. So one of the things you can do for seed bed preparation on this site would be to try to remove as much as that above ground biomass as possible. So you might use a, a grazing um, situation where you can graze off the biomass and then treat it with a herbicide and then seed it. Or you might also burn the site before seeding. And here's an example of using prescribed fire to reduce some of the litter on the site. So this is a pasture that is going to be renovated. You can see it was treated with a herbicide. Um, there was a lot of existing vegetative biomass and thick um, um, thatch layer that remained. And so a light burning of the area removed some of the thatch, still left a lot of organic matter on the site, but it helped you the seeders be able to get the seed cut down through the thatch layer and into contact with the soil. Preparing a seed bed by controlling existing vegetation is incredibly important. And I know a lot of landowners want instant results and they try to intercede into existing plant communities, but there are numerous studies out there that have shown that interceding into existing plant communities almost always fails. And that's because of competition for water and nutrients from existing vegetation. Um, the, your planting or your seeding operation is really going to be more successful if you can control your existing vegetation um, and prepare your seed bed well so that you can drill seed into the site and hopefully have enough soil moisture to establish a good stand. I will say that there are some exceptions where interseeding can work, uh, such as on a very wet site where conventional seedbed preparation is impossible, or if you want just really minor species composition changes in a field. Um, for example, you say you're trying to renovate a field and a pasture and you want to add some other species at maybe only 5 to 15 percent species composition, it can be done. Um, usually that type of interseeding involves spraying the site one or two times with herbicide or strip spraying a field before planting. Or another method might be to utilize the site with grazing to about 80 percent utilization before seeding. But I really want to be cautious with saying that because in general, interseeding methods commonly fail, and that's due to the competition with existing vegetation. OK, we're going to switch gears now a little bit and talk more about seedbed preparation or not seedbed preparation, but we're going to start talking about seeding installation. There are many different methods to seed. And drill seeding is really the preferred method because it provides the best seed to soil contact and places the seed below the soil surface so it can't be left exposed to the elements or to predators. Um, then there's also broadcast seeding, which simply scatters seed on the soil surface. And then aerial seeding and hydro seeding, which are forms of broadcast seeding. And we're gonna discuss all of those next. The best and most often used equipment for establishing conservation seedings is a grain or grass drill. It's also called a no-till drill or a rangeland drill. And the best drill is equipped with a few different features, including an agitator, double disc openers, depth bands, and packer wheels. So these combination of features really help provide excellent seed placement at the proper depths and provide that good seed to soil contact we keep talking about. Um, don't worry if your drill is missing some of these components because most equipment operators are really resourceful at rigging things up. For example, if you don't have packer wheels behind a drill, um, you might pull a, a chain behind your drill to lightly cover the seed with the soil. But let's just go through these photos and look at a few of the features of a drill. So in the upper left here, you can see this drill has a cutter wheel. 
that goes in front that's going to cut down through the thatch layer or standing stubble. Then there's a double disc opener. Um, that is what's creating the furrow in the soil for the seed to drop. So you can see the seed boxes up on top. The seed will be coming through these tubes and drop into the furrow created by the double disc opener, which you can see here. Here's our double disc opener. Here's the seed dropping onto the site. Then behind the openers, which are here in the upper right photo, you're going to have packer wheels that go over the furrow and pack the soil over the top of the seed. This is a photo on the bottom right of the agitators within the seed box. So if you have seed that's different sizes or some fluffy seed that's mixed in, um, you want to prevent it from separating in, in your seed box. And so having so agitators within your seed box helps keep all of those species mixed and seeding at um, even rates. It's um, really important to make sure your drill is going to be maintained in good operating condition. So check for any rusty openers, any clogged tubes that might prevent seed flow. Um, and also to make sure that your wheels are adequately inflated because it's going to affect your seeding rate. There are a lot of benefits from for using a no-till drill in a seeding. Uh, first is that you can plant seeds directly into existing plant residue. So you have um, minimized any sort of disturbance to the site. Also, neutral drills are really great at seeding to a specific depth and seeding at a specific rate. And um, what we've been talking about all along, they're great at providing good seed to soil contact. And um, because we're minimizing soil disturbance, no-till drills are good at reducing erosion. And because we're not disturbing the soil, we're also conserving soil moisture and preserving soil organic matter and aggregate stability. Also, no-till drills have a smaller carbon footprint than other seeders because there's less passes over the field. And so we're also then reducing our fuel costs. I do want to mention that there are some shortcomings of using a drill, but these can usually be overcome. And one of them is that um, some people don't like that they seed in rows, which can look unnatural. So a way to get around that is to do a cross seeding on a site if the rows are unsightly for you or not going to be um, good for your, your site conditions. Also, some of the long seeds or narrow seeds um, can get lodged in the seeder or different size seeds can separate in the box. And you can use an agitator or a seed carrier to help alleviate those issues. And then finally, um, the drill furrows that are created when seeding, some people find that they might enhance erosion if they're going up and down a slope. So make sure that you're seeding perpendicular to a slope to avoid that. Let's look now at some of the different types of seeders. This, in this photo, is a no-till air drill that drills the seed into the soil, but the seed is moved through the seeder using forced air. And in some seeders, the air forces the seed all the way down to the ground. And in other seeders, it's going to force it into the tubes where then gravity takes it um, to fall down into the ground. But I want to just point out the similar features of this drill. So we have the seed boxes, we have the cutter wheels, we have the double disc openers, and we have the packer wheels in back. This is a photo of a rangeland drill that's used in reclamation projects. Some advantages of this type of drill is that you can change your row width. You can also closely regulate your seeding depth and seeding rate, and then it's going to pack the seed um, behind the drill seeder with a packer wheel for that good soil to seed to soil contact. If you're working with a producer that doesn't have a drill seeder, just be aware that there's places you can rent drill seeders. So 
check with your implement dealer, also your conservation district offices, our partners like Pheasants Forever have some drills available, and also check some of your weed districts in your area for drills. To achieve the desired outcome of a seeding practice, it's really important to calibrate our seeding equipment so that the recommended amount of seed is uniformly planted. Um, many people want to calibrate a grass drill by looking at the seed chart that's on the inside cover of the drill. And because um, grass grains are usually a really large seed, that chart doesn't work well for conservation seedings where we have much smaller seeds. So you're going to have to calibrate your drill seeder. And we have a couple resources available for calibrating a seed drill, um, some tech notes, and we'll provide those links at the end of the webinar. Let's talk now about broadcast seeding. So broadcast seeding randomly scatters seed over the soil surface. And you might be using broadcast seeding because it's the type of equipment that's available to you, or you have a small site that doesn't really facilitate using large equipment, or you might be on a steep site or a remote or rocky site where broadcast seeding is gonna be really the only feasible way to seed. Um, in addition, you might use broadcast seeding for some extremely small seeds like sagebrush, which like to be placed right at the soil surface for establishment. When broadcast seeding, you want to really make sure you have good soil preparation. So creating the safe sites for the seeds that we talked about, where your seed is going to fall into those and not just simply be sitting on the soil surface where they're going to be exposed to predators and the elements. To improve our seed to soil contact when we use broadcast seeding, you can roll the soil with a cult packer or a dragging a harrow or pulling a roller harrow um, over the site. I will mention that broadcast seeding is the cheapest and easiest method of seeding but the seed is not placed as accurately and as a result the seeding results are not as good as when you're drill seeding so to compensate for that we double the seeding rates um, in order to improve the seeding success and pictured here are just a couple of broadcast equipment for small scale applications um, just a hand broadcaster like if you're using it on a small site like um, a log yard um, or a burn pile that you're seeding after um, burning. Or um, on the bottom here is uh, an example of a broadcast seeder for an ATV. This is an example of broadcast seeding that was conducted um, on a reclamation site. And the seed that was used was kind of a fluffy seed and some small seed. And because the seeder didn't have an agitator in it, somebody's just sat on the back of the four wheeler and just hand agitated or hand mixed the seed so that it would be distributed evenly during the application. And um, this is a photo of just, you know, getting creative with some of the seeding techniques, dragging a, a harrow, weighing it down with some tires, you know, just being creative with the equipment that you have on site and then just knowing what you need to do to help improve the likelihood of success and improve the ability for that seed to get in good contact with the soil. All right, let's just scale up on some of the equipment again. This is a cult packer seeder, which combines broadcast seeding and rolling in one operation. So you can see there's a, a seed box here that's calibrated, and then there's two sets of corrugated rollers. So the first roller is gonna be going over the ground, creating um, shallow corrugations in the soil. And then the seed drops down between the two sets of rollers. And then the second set of rollers splits the ridges of the corrugation and covers the seed and firms it with soil um, as it passes over it. Also, um, 
if you don't have a lot of larger equipment available for you on your site, there are a lot of really good um, implements you can get for ATVs now. This is a broadcast seeder that's spreading from the back of an ATV. And this is a single wheel cultipacker used to firm the soil after seeding. Here is another example of a broadcast seeder. This is an air seeder that's commonly used to plant agricultural crops. So again, the air forces the seed through the machine, through the tubes, onto the ground. This seeder also has tine harrows to roughen and smooth soil clods on the soil surface. And after the seed is placed on the ground, it has a set of roller tires to press the seed into the soil surface. I briefly want to mention aerial seeding and hydro seeding. These aren't methods that we use often in NRCS conservation seedings, but they can be used in some practices like our critical area plantings. The aerial seeding applies the seed with an airplane or a helicopter, and it's considered a broadcast method of seeding. And it's often used to spread grasses or legumes in large areas of land that need vegetative cover and need some erosion control. So for example, after a wildfire. Aerial seeding can also be used to seed cover crops and to standing commodity crops. And for aerial seeding, we also increase our seeding rate. But check it with your conservation practice standard for the required uh, rates involved in aerial seeding. Aerial seeding is the least accurate method of applying a uniform seeding rate, and it doesn't incorporate the seed into the soil. Um, hydro seeding, which you can see on the right, is where seed is applied by spraying it onto the ground with a water and mulch slurry, and it's typically used on extremely steep slopes. Uh, the slurry also includes a tackifier to hold the soil in place, and it can be a really successful way for revegetating steep slopes, but it is quite expensive and it requires specialized hydro seeding equipment. Okay, now that we've discussed some of the seeding equipment, let's talk about when you should seed. Seeding date is really going to vary from a dry land to irrigated site and with the type of seeds that you're seeding as well as what your local climate is and your soil type and soil moisture content. Um, let's first start out by talking about irrigated pasture. So our irrigated pasture, it's really going to be variable when you're going to plant the site. Uh, you need to make sure that your irrigation source of water is going to be consistent so it doesn't just turn off midsummer when your seedlings are trying to establish. What our goal is here is to get our seedlings up and established by late August and to a seedling stage where they have three to five leaves before they want to stop growing in the fall. So this is going to require having at least 30 to 45 days of growth from the planting date. But definitely avoid planting in the middle of the hot summer. It's going to be more um, common for you to be seeding either cool season species or warm season species on a dry land site. And that's going to be done um, in a much narrower window of time. So in general, because we're relying on Mother Nature to provide the water, we want to seed either a fall dormant seeding during the late fall, or we want to seed an early spring um, seeding. So by a fall dormant seeding, we're talking after October 15th, the soil temperatures are below 40 to 45 degrees, and we're putting the seed into the ground before it freezes. And that seed is going to stay dormant in the soil until spring when it has adequate moisture to germinate. If we're seeding in the spring, we want to aim for really the earliest we can access the field um, and the soil is workable so it's not too wet for the equipment. 
uh, you have good soil moisture, the ground's not frozen, and you want to get the seed into the soil so it can take advantage of all that spring moisture and hopefully have, you know, 30 to 45 days of soil moisture available for it. The last date you really want to seed is May 15th. That's kind of the edge of the seeding window. Um, and it's really going to depend on how much moisture you have in the soil. Also, definitely check your um, conservation practice standard for any seeding date requirements. Uh, I do want to mention if you're going to be aerial broadcast seeding, for example, um, seeding a wildfire burn site, you're going to be aiming for that late fall dormant seeding again. And if you can't get it seeded in that window, then aim for a late winter seeding. And by late winter, I mean you still have a little bit of snow on the ground or maybe the snow's just melted. Um, if you do have snow on the ground, think about a corn type snow texture where you have a lot of air in your snow and the seed can work its way down through the snow into the ground. What you definitely don't want to do is seed on any sort of snow that is hard crusted and, and packed because your seed is just going to blow over the top of your snow and, and travel to places where you didn't really want it. Like I said, our most common practices in our area are going to be fall dormant seeding or early spring seeding. Okay, to wrap up our presentation, I want to give you just a few examples of putting together all the items we talked about today, including the seed bed preparation for the soil and vegetation, our seeding method, and our seeding timing. These are going to be three different common practices that you might use, but again, I just want to emphasize that what you're going to do on your site is really going to be site specific. In this example, um, this was a site that was pasture grass for a number of years. Uh, it had a history of some annual weeds in the area. It was right next to a driveway, so there were some compaction issues. So the site prep um, included using a non-selective herbicide application, which was glyphosate, with a light tillage. And we did that to control the plants, also prepare the soil, reduce any sort of compaction issues. And because it was kind of weedy on the site, we did that for two growing seasons to try to reduce the amount of weed seed that was on the site. You can see that the seed bed was nice and firm and that when someone walked across the seed bed, the footsteps sank about a half an inch deep. Um, we then put this seeded this site in a fall dormant seeding. Um, so this is a November seeding. The ground is not frozen, um, but it was right before a, a fall snowstorm. And we seeded it with a drill seeder so that we got the good seed to soil contact. Another example is a small site um, seeding that we did on about a quarter of an acre. Um, this little enclosure, you can see it's enclosed by a fence. It had been used in the past for seeding shrubs and other species into. There was a lot of work that was done to remove any sort of perennial grasses from the site, but there was a lot of cheatgrass on the site. And the goal for this project was to seed a showy milkweed for monarch butterflies. The vegetation on the site was prepared with two early spring applications of glyphosate to treat the remaining cheatgrass. Um, we then checked our herbicide label to make sure we were within or the plant back time. So we weren't um, having the herbicide affect our seed. We drill seeded into the treated lit litter and plants. Um, because the soil was workable and it wasn't compacted, we didn't have to have any other sort of soil preparation method. And you can see on the right, after the herbicide um, was affected, effective and removed the cheatgrass, that we had a nice little row of um, milkweed coming up in our drill road after drill seeding. 
Um, the final example I'm going to share is a site that, let's see, it is a CRP site that lacks a lot of the species diversity needed for the CRP program, so it needed to go through a renovation program to meet requirements. Uh, the site is cur currently dominated by perennial species, so um, addressing the perennial species on the site and preparing it for seeding is going to be more intensive um, because it's going to take a while to um, wear down some of those perennial vegetation that's on the site before we can seed it and not have issues with competing vegetation. So on a site like this, you might use a herbicide application in the spring when it greens up and maybe again in the fall if you have another green up period. And you may do that for one or two years. Then you might use a cover crop during the growing season just to hold the soil in place and to again be competing with the existing vegetation on site. Before you plant the site, you want to make sure that any um, excessive litter is removed from the site. So you might either harvest or burn it um, prior to seeding. And then I would suggest going in and planting a new seed mixture as a dormant fall planting with a no-till drill. I want to leave you with just a few take-home messages from today's presentation. First of all, the ideal seed bed is going to be uniformly firm. It's going to have good seed to soil contact and be free of competing vegetation. For seeding, the most common seeding methods are using a drill seeder or a broadcast seeder. And drill seeding is going to provide you the best seed to soil contact and the best seeding results. Make sure that you select your equipment based on the conditions of the site and the availability of that equipment. And then for proper timing of seeding, you're going to be aiming for a late fall dormant seeding or an early spring seeding, and that's to take advantage of the natural moisture on the site. But always make sure you have moisture near the soil surface um, to provide for the germinating seeds on site. Before we end, I want to remind you that we have this webinar and others saved on the Montana Wyoming Plant Materials website. You can access this and other trainings. Also, I would suggest you look at some of our technical notes, um, calibrating a drill seeder or principles of seedbed preparation. And that is all for today. So thank you for participating.